All right. Good evening out there in podcast land, and welcome to another episode of Muggle with a Mic. Today, we are going to have a special um, interview. We're going to have a special guest speaker, Nick Reynolds. Uh, you might recognize him from different TV shows, including Orange is the New Black, The Blacklist, uh, Kimmy Schmidt, Alpha House, uh, Marvelous Miss Maisel, and Close Encounters of the Cab Kind. Yeah, we were so happy to have Nick on. Uh, he was so kind and gracious to take some time out of his day to have a conversation with us and answer some of our questions. He gave us some awesome information that I was just absorbing and loving every minute and every word. So hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as we did. So without further ado, here is Muggle with a Mic featuring Nick Reynolds. Nick, that voice you heard, the deep baritone voice is Phil. (laughs) How you doing, Phil? Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you as well. Excited to have you. Well, no, I'm I'm glad. This is uh, it's a little surreal, but like, you know, I I I love Katie, and you know, let's talk about acting. Let's uh, let's get into this thing. Let's do it. Yeah, I mean, when I started this podcast. We've we've done a few episodes where we're talking about movies, and then I was thinking, man, it would be really neat to have an interview on here. And it, immediately, I thought of of Nick, and I'm so excited that you you accepted. And yeah, let's talk acting. So, Nick Reynolds, I have I have some questions here that we were going to go over with some of your background. You are an actor, correct, sir? I am an actor. Um, do you mind though? Before we get going, I listened. Yeah. I listened to the Office episode you guys did, the, yes. the previous one. Okay, and may I chime in? Go for it. I, I was not on there, but you didn't have the best quote from Office, and I had I had to jump in. I honestly think the funniest thing said on television in the last twenty years is when Michael Scott comes through the door. And addresses the room and says in the most serious way possible that he declares bankruptcy. <laughs> I, I honestly think that is just brilliant. Whoever came up with it, how he executed it. And then the next scene with Oscar telling him that he can't just say it. And he said, well, I didn't say it. I declared it. Because <laughs> um, it makes all the difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the idea that that idiot thinks... That means something, what he just did. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. No, you're fine. If only that actually worked, how much different would the world that we live in be? Yeah, I think it would be a better place. It would. I declare I'm funny. Yeah, you just say it and it's true. I wonder if there's anything like that going on right now. No, (laughs) never mind. We won't won't go there. (laughs) All right, so speaking of the office and television shows, what are some of your favorite shows and TV shows or directors that you have currently or of all time oh man i was a um my wife and i are both big 30 rock fans we watched all the office although for me the office stops the day michael leaves i have uh and i still rewatch the simpsons to this day i i I really think uh the simpsons humor will be relevant for the rest of the time same with uh seinfeld you know we go down the netflix rabbit holes We're, we're i'm i'm a fan of what i do so i watch as much as I possibly can. We we recently caught up on HBO Succession. Have you guys seen that? I have not seen that, but I saw that was on your, your list of things you've been in, but it I had not seen it before, but now I want to. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. It's Yeah, it's an HBO show. It's only had two seasons, and the, the only way I can explain it to you is it's about horrible people being horrible to each other and to everyone else. You know, it's 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 keeping in the theme of the last 10 years with the anti-heroes, right? We, mm. we we love anti-heroes. They're just it's just so well cast and they're they're so despicable, but it's but it's entertaining. It's it, it, that really has been our favorite show recently. Who are some of the people in it? It's it's a uh, based on a family, which a lot of people say the family itself is is loosely based on the Murdochs. Um, oh. So the patriarch of the family is played by Brian Cox. 
uh, one of the Culkin brothers is in it. There's a bunch of people who have kind of been lifetime character actors, uh, but they all come together to form this family. And um, the scene that I did was with Eric Bogosian, who's an author and an actor who has kind of a recurring role as a senator trying to um, possibly be president Mm -hmm. on the show. But yeah, Brian Cox is the lead. Interesting. We'll have to tune into that. Phil, did you have something to say? Um, I was just going to ask if uh, you're talking The Simpsons, uh, have you ever done any voice acting work? And would you possibly like to be on The Simpsons if given the chance? Oh, my gosh. Like um, it, it is. I shouldn't speak for every actors, but it's a lot of actors dreams to do voiceover work. You know, it, it is uh, it can be really lucrative. It can be really fun. The idea of working from home which not every voiceover actor does certainly, but the, the, you know, getting to that point is great too. I would love to do it. I have, I have done a small, small little bit. I've done a couple um, edits on shows that I've done where uh, I think most notably I said the F word in one of the shows and I had to go back later on and record a different F word over top of it in case it ever aired, you know, not on cable. I also did this thing uh, years and years ago where there was a, a movie that actually never even came out, but they were looking for somebody that could do some filler work here and there, do an impression of one particular actor. And I went in and did that for an afternoon and I loved it. It's a skill like everything else, you know, it really takes a lot of work and knowing the right people. And there are not a lot of those jobs out there. <laughs> That's why we, that's why we all want to do it. You know, there's there's thousands and thousands of us wanting to do this, and the voiceover work is few and far between. Yeah, I know if you look at a lot of animation, uh, the different shows, there's it seems like there's a core group of actors that do all the different voices. Yeah, somebody said to me a long time ago that if you wanted, I'm going to use the theater reference here, but if you wanted to start a theater, what you needed to do was hire all your friends. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's that's the way this business works like anything else, right? Who you want to work with, the people you like. And there's always chemistry when you do that too. Nothing seems forced. It seems like, wow, this thing this thing works. This thing makes sense. So yeah, I definitely see what you're talking about. Well, and absolutely. If you go back to 30 Rock, I mean, why do, does Tina Fey constantly work with the same people? It's because it's a, it's a magic you can't reproduce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the Tina Fey stuff, yeah, if you're if you're a fan of of her and Robert Carlock, yeah, you see so many of the same people again and again and again. They just they they like who they like, you know. Mm-hmm. And they're smart. They're they're smart, funny people. Absolutely, absolutely. It's like Tim Burton. He always has the same group of people that he works with. Oh yeah, yeah. At first, like you know, for an actor, it can be annoying because we're like, give me, let me, let me get in there for crying out loud. Why does it have to be that person every single time? But, you know, people have what works for them. People have their formula. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. There you go. So speaking of 30 Rock and you live in New York City, correct? Yes, I do. In Queens, New York. I live in Astoria, Queens. But you're originally from Huntington, West Virginia. Born and raised. My parents are still there. And also, I have to I have to throw this in there. You're also a Bucko fan. I am a Pirates fan. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, most people, not most people, some people might know West Virginia doesn't have a professional team. So I think West Virginia people would professionally be fans of the Cleveland Browns or, you know, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh franchises. And I got into liking baseball a little later in life. And I thought, well, I can't jump on any bandwagons, and there's none. There's no team less bandwaggy than the Pittsburgh Pirates. So that's who I joined up with. I've been a loyal fan for 15 years now. Very good decision. And now that I'm in the city, I have to have a, a baseball team that I root for. So obviously, I'm a Mets fan. And the people that I work with all the time are like, why not? Why aren't you a Yankees fan? Why aren't you a Yankees fan? And I'm always like, you need more fans. <laughs> That's, that's something you need. There's an obnoxious Yankee hat in every city I go to uh, across the world. Why don't I just be a nice NL guy? Hey, I, I'm, I'm for that. Uh, yeah. Be a Mets fan over a Yankees fan. That's good. Um, so how did you, what was the process of moving from 
Huntington to New York, what are differences, similarities, and how do you like living in New York? Well, the the process for me, I did uh, theater training in school. I went to Marshall University and I got a BFA there. I got after that, I went to Penn State and got um, a master's there. And then it was really going to be between Chicago or New York. There's really, if you're an actor, it's become there's there's more and more places nowadays. But you know, ten fifteen years ago, it was do you want to go to L.A., Chicago, or New York? And I had uh, after grad school, I had some interests from agents in New York, so I was like, let's let's try New York. I can't be an actor and not say that I tried, right? So we mm-hmm. moved up here with a group of friends, and it took me uh, four years before I got my first television audition. But, wow. you know. How difficult is that? Uh, just getting an audition for a TV commercial? Uh, I mean, is that like really, really difficult? Do they see a lot of people? Oh, man. All right. I'm going to try and not be <laughs> long-winded here. Stop me if you need to stop me. Um, no, we're gonna we're gonna be sponges. We're gonna absorb everything you say. <laughs> I always okay. kind of it really interests me. I always wondered what the audition process was like. Well, yeah, or what yeah. you would do to to um, I mean, when, obviously, when you go in, do you know what you're auditioning for? When it's a commercial, do you know what product, or do they just kind of have like mass casting calls and and they do two or three different commercials at a time? There are um, so many different types of auditions and the information that you get varies depending on what you're auditioning for. And honestly, it depends on your union status. There's a lot of um, work in the commercial world right now for non-union actors. So I have never had a non-union commercial audition. I couldn't really tell you what those were like, but for the union auditions... It, let's let's say for the commercial world, you are going to know a little bit going into a commercial audition because most of the things you see nowadays are kind of spontaneous feeling and and very natural and based on chemistry and they you, you know it's a very short amount of time to sell a product and they want to see how you think on your feet for a commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is a lot of improv for lack of a better term. There's a lot of, all right, so um, I got the three of you guys in here. Let's just say it's Karen's birthday and there's <laughs> cake in the conference room. Go. And they just kind of, <laughs> just, yeah, it's kind of, they give you a length of rope, right? As far as the TV world, it really is difficult to get a television audition if you don't have representation. And that's just a fancy term for an agent or a manager. Uh, in the city. And nowadays kind of what happens is I will the, maybe the night before, sometimes two days before, but normally the night before I will get um, some sides or the lines that are going to happen the next day, a schedule in terms of like, like the time that my audition is when I have to be there. Uh, I'll get a little bit of a character breakdown, which will say, you know, for me, the character breakdowns are always very humbling because I'm a character actor. So it's always like, He's fat, but not too fat. Or uh, <laughs> my favorite one ever, uh, it was for an HBO show. It said he's balding, but hip. I was like, hey, <laughs> is he losing his hair? Yeah. Can he hang? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was good. And then you spend that night and the next morning doing your homework. And then you'll, uh, yeah, you'll go in. Uh, I really couldn't tell you how many people they see. For these auditions, I think it's anywhere from five or six people to twenty or thirty people. But you know, what 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 we're getting at here is casting directors, and casting directors are really the people that have the keys to the kingdom. Mm-hmm. They are they are who they're who you want to know when they know you by your first name. You feel like a million bucks. <laughs> they are you, you've heard you know the term like lose the battle but win the war, right? Yeah. Winning the war is getting a casting director to like you. Wow. Um, I'll give you a quick example, if you don't mind. Um, Go for it. When, yeah. I did, when I did the blacklist, I had auditioned five or six times before I got the role that I wanted, uh, or, or the role that I eventually got. And looking back on it, 
everything that I would have booked before the one that I booked was not as meaty. There was not as much stuff to do. And Mm. the casting director was saying, good job, but not yet. Good job, but not yet. It doesn't Mm. matter. It doesn't matter that you do a good job in terms of the role, right? You have Mm. to do a good job. You want to be on the good list. When it's a match, then it's a match. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Hell yeah. When you land a role, say, like on the blacklist, and there's an established cast, and you go in, is that intimidating for you oh, as an actor? Yeah. Absolutely. I've always kind of wondered that, you know, just going in, and here you have, uh, you're kind of on the outside, and you're coming in, and, you know, everybody knows everybody, but... Yeah, I try really hard as a character actor and when I when I say the term character actor, I mean a guy that comes in and is never really the lead. He's the guy that moves the story along. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I that's what I try to think of myself as. It's not that I'm not you know doing my homework and enjoying my time, but whenever I book these small TV roles, I go, "Why is this guy talking? Why are they talking to him? What am I doing for this story?" So I tell myself, "This machine is already running." right? This, this thing is running with or without me. It is my, my job to come in here and compliment this machine, be a part of it, and, and, then, and then move on. And, and hopefully I served the story uh, the way I was supposed to. But I would say Blacklist is the one that was the scariest. Zach, we spent the last 40 minutes being regaled with stories of Abe's latest visit to Phoenix, fascinating as it is to hear about the new culinary options at Sky Harbor Airport. I don't come here to talk to Abe. No offense, Abe. I had some trouble with the missus. You know how it is. But into business, your money's going to be cleaner than a nun's browser history. While you're redistributing, an investment opportunity has come up. I need funds of that amount. What are you buying this time? Another herd of Akulteka horses? Oh, God, no. Although one could never have enough of those beautiful animals. There is, however, a floundering cruise line in urgent need of a bailout. Elizabeth, I'd like to introduce you to one of my accountants, Zach Small. I'm an FBI agent. Mr. Reddington is my CI, which forces me to ignore his crimes, which will no doubt include murdering you if either of you ever tell anyone. On the other hand, I am under no obligation to ignore your crimes, so before you commit any while I'm here, I suggest you all run along. Because mm. James Spader is an intimidating feller. Mm-hmm. It's not me. He's not a bad guy or anything, but he's like, you know, I'm like, oh, geez, there he is. There's it Red. seems like he exudes confidence. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. He's got, you know, it's his yeah. show. He's executive yeah. producer. So he's, mm-hmm. the, wow. he's, every, he's everything there. You don't often work for, <laughs> for the lead actor and the executive producer at the same time. So, but I also try to try to tell myself that, that I, there's a reason that I'm here and that I belong yeah. here. You know, actors, yeah. actors confidence is a, is a funny thing, right? We, uh, We've all got imposter syndrome, or we think each job that we get is going to be the last job we ever have. But, you know, I, I talk about it with my wife, and I, I try so hard to to calm down and be like, no, I'm supposed to be here. I, I earned this. Let's, uh, let's mm-hmm. have fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's it like when you land a role as far as um, your daily schedule? I mean, do you just show up on the soundstage, and then do you have a read-through yeah, it's, it's different for different shows, actually, depending on the size of the role you get. Um, some of the roles that I've had that have just been one or two lines, I'll just show up the day of. There's no table read. They don't, they don't need to bring me in for that. Sometimes you do uh, go in for the table read when you're a little more integral to the story. Maybe there's a costume fitting a week or two ahead of time uh, that you'll go in, and, and it's, that's really quick. You know, you're, you're just there for an hour or so, and... That makes it so that when you show up on the day, everything's ready to go. There's no fitting needed or anything. Actors know this. Calls are early. Most of the calls for television are between 5 and 7 a.m. Um, mm. and, and television is like the, the total industry. You've heard the term hurry up mm. and wait. That, <laughs> is, that is television. That's uh, um, what I learned when I first <laughs> moved to the city. I told myself I would do some background work, right? because I wanted to see how the sausage gets made. 
Uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to do this forever. I just, I just want to see how it goes. And boy, nothing is more true than hurry up and wait. So yeah, the, a, a day is about being patient, about being where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there. And, and you know, enjoying it, not, not taking it too seriously. Being, being grateful to be there and really, really being present in the day because it's like, it's a fantastic thing. Like it's, it's what I wanted to do my whole life. Right. And I, I try really hard to, to be grateful. Oh yeah. So like with your scene in the blacklist or your orange and the orange is the new black, how many days of, of shooting is that for you? Is it multiple days? Is it all in one day? A couple of them have been multiple days. Some of them have been one day. The blacklist was three or four different days. Yeah. Yeah, they did an, an exterior one day, and then I came back a week later to do the interior. So, like, if you've seen the blacklist scene, I'm, like, driving a mm -hmm. car, and then I'm going into my house. I'm driving the car on a Wednesday somewhere up in uh, Yonkers, hmm. and then the next week, the interior of the house is actually Chelsea Pierce Studios in Manhattan. Hmm. There's so much of that. And if you guys watched Orange is the New Black, I want to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. <laughs> the entire interior of the prison of Orange is the New Black was in a basement uh, film studio in Queens, New York. Wow. What? It was, it was the most realistic, like, because my wife and I were fans of the show before I got to do it. And I got there and I was like, are you kidding me? Like the cinder blocks, the floor. It was such a phenomenal looking set. Now the exteriors are done upstate. Like when they're outside, right. you know, on the basketball courts and stuff. But the whole inside was in a in a sound studio in Queens. So each cell, <laughs> each cell has sunlight coming in from the windows. Uh, how how do they do that? Oh man, I you know what they're able to do with sound and lighting will really blow your mind. It's crazy. So so much basic. I, I, I don't know how many how to put it. I don't want, I don't want to sound like a fool. But so much of what you see in film and television when you're in somebody's house, um, when you're in somebody's apartment, uh, and there's natural light coming through, that's just, that's magic, right? It's, it's not real. Mm. They're in a studio somewhere. Hmm. The entire, did you guys, are you guys 80s babies like me? I, I just barely made the 80s. Okay. <laughs> I, I was, yes, I was uh, early 70s mid 70s 80s <laughs> okay well the the movie home alone like classic right oh yeah yeah the entire the entirety of the inside of kevin McAllister's house was on a basketball court at a middle school wow that, that is not the real house like stuff stuff like this is stuff like this is insane but they're so good they're just so good at what they do oh yeah and the reason you do that is because you can't control the elements right right but I can control everything if it's inside. It can be two o'clock in the afternoon all day long wow. if we're inside. We don't have to worry about the sun or the rain or the wind or anything else. Or it could be 11 p.m. at 2 p.m. There you go. Yeah. Wow. Huh. That's so neat. Well, so what is your favorite lesson or skill that you've learned that you've you've brought from all your schooling? I've been... um. You know, I, I I was thinking about this ahead of time, and I've been really, really, really lucky to have people that have said things to me that that stuck. You know, pro, like learning a process aside, there's just different things that people have said, and they stick with me. And I I actually am lucky enough to teach uh, an acting for film and television class at um, a college here in the city, and. I try so hard to remember these lessons and, and pass them on. There was a, one of the first teachers that I had talked about the magic that is you. And that is all of the stuff that you do at home in front of your parents that just makes, that just makes you wonderful. You're just wonderful. <laughs> and you bring that to school and that gets you to a point. And then after that, you know, you have to do the work. You have to learn the lines. You have to do the research for what I do now, you have to you have to look at the production team ahead of time. You have to be on time, take notes, and keep keep learning. So that all boils down to take this seriously, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, do your work, do your homework. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell them. 
d- do the homework because if you're not going to do it, somebody else is going to do it. Absolutely. Do you find it difficult to memorize lines? Um. Do you get a lot of time? Do they ever throw uh, like scripts at you last minute, and then it's like, oh my gosh, I have to know all this by five in the morning? You usually don't have ample time. If you're if you're going in for like a day player, which is primarily what I go in for, or a guest star or something, you get 24, 48 hours uh, to look over scripts. And the only stuff, honestly, that really gets me sometimes is when you're playing somebody in the medical field who is who is saying all of these words that a dummy from Huntington, West Virginia doesn't know. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I got to... I got to do a little more research there and try and look those up in terms of like memorizing lines. I still feel pretty confident in it because I, I do this thing called the no duh. I, that's what I tell myself. And I'm also dating myself by saying no duh, <laughs> but uh, it's a way to keep me listening to the other person. I make sure that when I'm doing the lines with my wife or, you know, whoever, if I'm listening to what they're saying, then my next line is, no duh. Well, that's what I would say to you. (laughs) Obviously, this makes sense. It keeps me out of being an actor that only highlights my own lines. Mm. Does that make Mm. sense? Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah, because you you not only have to memorize your own lines, you're in a way memorizing the other person's lines to react appropriately. Yeah, you, you do... Um, you do all this, you do all this work, you do all this prep, and then you try to just be present mm-hmm. when, when you're actually doing it and listen. Those are, uh, every actor wants to work with another actor that's listening to them. And we can always tell when you're not, mm-hmm. we, can, we can always tell when you're just waiting for me to stop so that you can go mm-hmm. and th- that stuff shows. Oh yeah. Wow. This is so neat, Nick. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, I hope so. I hope I'm not being boring. No, absolutely not. No, way. <laughs> no I love, I love uh, talking about it. Um, what has been your favorite role that you've played? And that could be, uh, you know, um, stage or screen. Yeah, a couple, I guess it's been five or six years ago now, I did a summer theater. Because uh, I'll do um, theater every now and then, although I, I haven't done a lot recently. Um, I did the show South Pacific. Mm-hmm. There is nothing like a dame. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um Billis, I got to play that that guy, the the kind of goofy, you know, navy man mm-hmm. who sings nothing like a dame and gets to dance in the hula skirt and stuff. And I was never a fan necessarily of the classics uh in musical theater of of Rodgers and Hammerstein or, or anything, but I that was the first role I'd ever done where I was like I could do this for the next five or six years. That'd be that'd be fine. What what was your very first acting role? Oh wow! Even child um, as a child. <laughs> as a child, uh, in third grade, I auditioned for uh, a community theater production of Oliver, um, the musical version of Oliver Twist. Yeah, and it was. Uh, I guess I had done church plays and stuff like that and my mother thought we've got a star here people <laughs> and i went and auditioned for that and you guessed it i did not book the role of oliver oh but i was in the show i was uh i was one of the <laughs> i was one of fagan's boys i got out of it a little in high school and in the beginning of college and then truth be told i was flunking out of college and i thought I'm going to take some theater classes to boost my GPA. Oh. And I fell in love with it again and I've stuck with it ever since. But Oliver Oliver Twist, first role, first first show. There you go. Wow. Let's see it worked out. It worked out. You maybe you were supposed to be more credits and then it led you in the path you you needed to go on. You know that might make my mom feel better. Um I'll tell her that. There you go. <laughs> is is there any particular movie franchise that you would like to be a part of huh or maybe a director like steven spielberg or or, uh, you know george lucas or anybody that you would particularly like to work on a film with um there's you know it sounds weird as an actor to say it but that i've never been like that's my director or, or, or that's my franchise. I, I'm certainly a fan of actors. Like there's, there's plenty of actors out there that I would 
kill a distant family member to work with. <laughs> um, if you guys have ever heard of Mark Rylance, he's a two-time Tony winner. He's won a, an Academy Award for, you know, you brought up Steven Spielberg. Did you guys see Bridge of Spies? Yes, I did. No, yeah. no, I haven't. Tom Hanks, right? Tom Hanks, yeah. The the spy that that he's kind of defending, that actor is Mark Rylance. Oh, okay. And he's um, he's done a lot of stuff. If if you look him up, he was just in Ready Player One, and uh, he's one of those guys that I saw do a show, man, twelve years ago, I think, and I was like. I like couldn't move. I was like, who, who is this? How can acting be this good? Hmm. And I've been a fan of his Laurie Metcalf too. I know everybody knows Laurie Metcalf from Roseanne, but if you, if you talk to a theater person about Laurie Metcalf, they'll, they'll be like, yes, queen. Hmm. One of the, one of the scenes that I share with my acting class is Viola Davis and Meryl Streep in doubt. And actors are rolling their eyes because it's like, yeah, doubt, doubt, doubt. Hmm. But have you guys seen Doubt? I have yet to. I wanted to, and then I just yeah, got I around to it, but I want to. It's a heavy watch. <laughs> it's not a Saturday night watch. It's, it's a heavy, <laughs> it's a heavy, heavy story. But there is a there is a scene between Viola Davis and Meryl Streep, and that's kind of what made Viola Davis blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, this this uh, rock in a hard place that she is is between in this scene. I won't spoil it for you, but if you get a chance, you'll be like this woman is, is about the best that there is. Mm. I am a fan of Viola though. Yeah. She's, um, if you guys saw fences a couple years ago, yeah. Um, Denzel, which was another, right. Yeah. With, with Denzel, that was an, that's an August Wilson, uh, play that mm-hmm. was made into a movie. She's Pittsburgh, right? You know. Yep. All of the, uh, Wilson was a, was a Pittsburgh guy. So a lot of his stuff is, is Pittsburgh based. Hmm. Well, here's here's my favorite question, Nick. Are you ready for this one? I'm ready. What accents can you do? <laughs> you know, I tried. I, I thought about this and when you were going to ask me this. Yeah. And um, I, I just. Here's the thing. <laughs> As an actor, we all we have a resume, right? And the resume says certain things that we are able to do. And every now and then, we'll tell a little fib, right? <laughs> and we'll pick it up later. I have accents listed on my resume that, you know, maybe I'm not the best at. And if I do them right here, Katie, I'm, I'm, I'm exposing the <laughs> lie. You see? I got to keep this grip going. I don't want. I don't want to harm your resume. We we, we will cut this part out. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> Everybody asks uh, for a southern accent, you know. Even though, you know, an actor will break a southern accent down in five or six different ways. Everybody wants you to do a standard British accent. I have an Irish friend who I kind of mimic from time to time, but very poorly. I've like, man, I've just never, I've never been good at accents. Well, now the, I'm I, the reason I wanted to ask you that is because of your your orange scene, because. What are you doing Russian in that one? <laughs> well, isn't it's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? It's a bit uh... <laughs> I couldn't pinpoint <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everybody's like, you know, he's a guy from I, I guess he's from Eastern Europe. He's, he doesn't want to be too specific about where he's from. He's been in the in the states for a while. The accent's a little muddled. Um, yeah. Hey, I thought it was good. Your skin looks like it will be very soft. <laughs> like a peach or a baby pig's belly (laughs) i aspire to put my hands on it and to inhale your hair in my dreams it smells like freshly baked gingerbread and my mother's rice pudding (laughs) swirled together It's quite a combination. You know, I, I want to tell you this too. Something that I something that I tell my students also is, without being crazy, sometimes you have to take a risk, right? Sometimes you have to try something, and that orange is the new black is a perfect example because everybody they told me everybody that had come through the door was doing a Billy Bob Thornton kind of version of that character. It was like hmm. way too 
heavy and and too scary and i tried one that was just creepier and goofier <laughs> and it worked and and they liked it so oh no that scene's awesome because she's just like what have i got myself into <laughs> that was a, that was such a fun day have you ever been in a situation where you've developed a character and then you've got on stage and the director's like nah i don't like it uh, try something <laughs> else oh. I mean, how much guidance do you have before like going in, like what, what they expect out of you? Well, I'll tell you on, in the TV world, not much because the, the TV world happens. Things happen so fast. Things are, things are set up and boom, one, two, three takes moving on one, two, three takes moving on. There's, there's really not a lot of time to, to talk about things. What, you know, when you're on my level, when you're a, when you're a guy trying to make a, a name for himself now, if you're a principal or something, there's a lot more time. But long story short, in the principal world, you need to kind of you need to do your homework and make a choice that you think meshes with the show. Now, if you're doing if you're doing theater, you have a whole lot more time. Mm. You can you can come in with what you think, and it's a it's much more of a collaboration um, between between you and the director. But I think a lot of times. As an actor, you're not gonna you're not gonna encounter a lot of resistance because through the audition process, you have made some choices that they liked, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 not gonna be not that it doesn't happen, but it's probably not very often you come in with something that's completely off the wall because for some of these things, there are seven and eight and nine rounds of auditions. You know, they they look at you and they look at you again and they look at you again and. And they they know what you can do, and they like it. Right. They hired you for a reason, right? There you go. Yeah. Now, how how nerve wracking is that having to audition seven or eight times for something? I mean, in our minds, in our you know mundane lives, we think you audition once and you get it. Right. No, that was um, that was one of the, the things you got to learn the hard way for sure. I think if you are an actor and you audition and you get a call back one out of 10 or 20 times then you you celebrate right mm -hmm. because i'll speak for the tv world because that's what i've been doing mostly the last few years there are so many factors out of your hands that you cannot get too down on yourself right mm -hmm. you just have to go into these auditions you have to you have to audition for the casting director, not for the role. Like I was saying earlier, you have to you have to do a good job and establish its reputation, mm -hmm. and then you got to try and let it go, which uh, every actor will tell you is impossible, because they maybe that day they were looking for somebody two inches taller because you were standing next to somebody else. Jeez. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just they like you, but you're not exactly right for this. We want to save you for something down the line. There's just there's just way too many things out of your hands. And honestly, once I knew that, once I bought into that, it made me so much more relaxed mm -hmm. in the audition room. You know, it's it, you start out and you want everything that you go in for. And you're like, I, I need this. I got to have it. I got to build this. I got to get 10 rolls this year. I got, I got to do it. You start to realize that that is not most people's paths, right? Mm -hmm. That that's not really your job. And when you tell yourself that all you can do is do your homework and do a good job, it makes it a little easier, a little, you know, you feel like a pro. You're like, nah, I did my thing. It's up to them now. <laughs> your turn. I've, I've done my job. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. It is still, I don't, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, I'm not nervous. Certainly I'm nervous. And there are, there are some things I go in for, like I, a uh, year ago, I got to read for the West Side Story movie and Ooh. I keep thinking, I'm like, um, I could be working for Steven Spielberg in a couple of weeks. Like there, there's no way I'm not going to be nervous about that. Yeah. Uh, but the the nerves are still there. Oh yeah. Um, has there been a part that you have been super nervous about? Um, there's, a, there's a particular, there's two casting directors here in the city that I, even with a gun to my head, I won't tell you their names <laughs> who have had really high profile, TV shows and movies. And even though I, I've um, been cast by both of them at this point, they still intimidate the heck out of me. 
just sure. because they are no nonsense people. Like I, I'm from West Virginia. You guys are from Ohio. There is all of this, you know, kind of, I'll, I'll call it Southern for lack of a better term. I know it's not really Southern, but this, you know, these niceties that we do and this time we spend about, Hey, how you doing? And all this stuff. And they don't have any of that up here. Mm. They don't have time for any of that. <laughs> you know, you go, you go in, you get your one shot. Thank you. And you leave. And it's really hard to like uh, unpack all that emotionally. It's it's hard not to feel like there's a lot riding on it. You know, mm. you have to you have to find a way to be like, no, no, no. This is and this is another thing I tell my students that they want you to be the solution to their problem. Mm. They don't want you to come in and be terrible. Then they got to do more stuff. Everybody just wants to go home, right? right yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants like I would love it if the first three people that came in were amazing. <laughs> Boom, you got it. Let's go home. So thinking that the casting director is actually on our side and not this, you know, the man behind the curtain is another thing that's helped me be less nervous than I was before. They're human, just like you and I. They are. And they're good at their job. That's another thing actors have to tell themselves about New York casting, because I can only speak for New York casting directors. They're behind that chair for a reason, right? Mm. They're, they're good at their jobs. You don't need, we don't need to fool them. We don't need to wine and dine them. We need to trust the process because there's a reason they're over there. You be the puzzle piece and just try to find and make sure that they're, they have the puzzle that you fit into. Exactly. Yep. Um, if if you could play any iconic role, what what role would you want to play? Iconic role. Harry Potter. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh man, I'm I'm gonna have to think about that. I, like my instinct is just to say more than anything, I just want to be a principal on a television show. I want to, mm-hmm. you know, I want to be a principal role that that's there every single week uh iconic roles oh man do you think that that would be boring after like four or five years playing the same role over and over i definitely think it gets to people yeah i i I think like anything else jim gaffigan has this great joke about taking his kids to disney world and he said they stayed at the animal kingdom and he said, oh, the first night, the first day we were there, it was amazing. We got up and right outside of our room, a giraffe. And by day four, I'm like, oh, giraffe again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's how everybody is, right? It's like, it's amazing. But sure, you'll get over anything. You'll, you'll get tired of anything. So I'm sure, you know, it would at a certain point, which is why most people don't do the same thing forever. And they'll, they'll leave a show. They'll, you know, a lot of people here in the city... Uh, a lot of TV people do Broadway as well, you mm-hmm. know, so if they're only filming half the year, they've got another half of the year to go go do what they want. I know there's probably also the fear of being, if you're staying a role for so long, so many years, uh, to be stereotyped and not being able to be hired as a different character. Oh, um, yeah. Is that reasonable? I mean, is that everybody's used to seeing them, you know, in that role for 10 years? It's, I, I think television suffers that worse than any other industry, right? Look at some of the classic comedic shows of all time. And the number two guy, the goofy guy, can never break that stereotype again. Yeah. Kramer is Kramer. George is George. Mm. Uh, Dwight is Dwight. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not that these people can't do other things, but yes, yeah, certainly. I think the industry can give and the industry can take away. I'm sure... It is incredibly frustrating for those people who are very talented to have the the blessing of this phenomenal role to have, but the curse of being seen as it uh, for the rest of time. So I think, yeah, I think it's definitely frustrating for some people. Always a bridesmaid. Well, yeah. I also going back to the playing a role the same time over and over. What is your thought? Like supernatural, I think is in season like 15, 16 or 17. Could you imagine playing a role for that long? Do you feel like you would grow unattached to the character? 
Well, I know kind of the example here in the city is Mariska Hargitay on mm. um, SVU, mm-hmm. how she's done it for such a long time, but she's also used her position to like fight for women's rights mm. and, um, you know, fight for rape victims. And she she's done so much good from it. So I, I think if if you're blessed enough to be sorry, making that money and, and getting, getting that role, then maybe you do, maybe you're able to do what she does and, and give back and find a way to use that status to, to do some good. I think there's plenty of people, plenty of people that do that. Absolutely. But yeah, I think, I, you know, anything would get, would get tiresome, right? Hopefully, like I said, hopefully somebody who is in that position can also find time to feed their soul. They're feeding their wallet on the one hand. Maybe they can feed their soul mm. uh, a different time of the year. Oh yeah, absolutely. What actors inspire you, or what what actors do you take hints from? You know, I was, th- I was thinking about this because being the being who I am as an actor, I, I try to make the most out of what I'm given. And anytime we're watching TV or a movie. And we find somebody that's got one or two lines and they just, they're memorable Mm -hmm. or they nail it. That's honestly who inspires me. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, yes. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Thank you. Like you got a little, you got a little crumb, you got a little something and you just ate it right up. Good for you. I, I love when I see that. I'll give you an office example when they do safety training (laughs) all the cpr instructor the cpr the woman that comes in and does the cpr doll can you imagine anybody else (laughs) in that role she's she's perfect for that role and i'm like i've never seen her before or since but like somebody like that that comes in and just does the dang thing i'm I'm always so impressed oh she did such an amazing job because she's acting the way we are when we're watching it. That's how we would be if we walked into that office and she did, she did it perfectly. Yeah. It's really hard to like, um, you know, you watch things and you're where people where actors are trying to play like they're not actors. Like they're just people being interviewed on the street or something. You're like, yeah, ah, that's an actor. Forget it. Actor. It's really hard. (laughs) It's really hard to once you become an actor, once you learn all these lines, it's really hard to just, let it all go and be normal for lack of a better term. Mm. And, uh, whenever I see people do it, I'm always, always super impressed. <laughs> well, so what are you working on right now, Nick? Well, COVID shut a lot of right. basically everything down. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I bet. You know, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it, it's going to be tough coming back. I think here in, here in the city, we're, we're recording this on a Saturday on Monday, we're going to enter phase two of our reopening. We don't technically know yet when the film and TV world will come back. I know that the SAG president has a plan in place that's been approved about, you know, how to work safely. And it's a, you know, a phenomenal union that's going to protect us. But it's going to be a while before film sets look like film sets again. I actually, just before the break, filmed two episodes of this show called search party. Have you guys heard of search party? I, yeah, I just saw an ad for it. It's in season three. And I was like, well, I might want to get HBO now. Yeah. It's on, uh, it's on HBO max. Yeah. Um, it was on TBS for the first two seasons. And then this third and fourth season are going to be on HBO max. And, I, I have a small, uh, recurring role in that, that I got filmed just under the wire. So awesome. <laughs> I, was, I was glad to nice. get that. Yeah. Well, now I'm definitely getting it. I was on the fence, but now I'm totally going to get it. And I'll tell you guys, honestly, that was the most fun I've ever had because it was like the the show is is scripted, but there's a lot of improv. It's just a lot of like, it's a lot of funny people. And it was just such a, like a warm, open set. Like it was all yes. There was no, no. It was, it was great. Awesome. How much liberty do you have? Like when you go in and you're working with a script, I mean, I remember John Delancey talking about when he was on Star Trek, everybody was like, oh, it must be like great, you know, working on that TV show. He said, like, not really, because, you know, you had to know the script by rote. I mean, if you had, if you were in a big monologue and you got one word wrong, they'd stop you and you'd have to start over. 
is most TV like that, or do you have like a little bit of wiggle room, uh, room to improv? Um, what's your experience been with that? I've only had one or two instances where there's been any kind of uh, improving. For the most part, you know, as as an actor, especially as somebody that's coming into a thing that already exists, um, I want to have respect for the process, and I want to I want to have respect for the writers and the team, and I I, I want to say their words. They took the time to come okay. up with a thing that works, and I want to yeah I want to I want to do their work. I want to give their words the respect that they deserve Mm -hmm. that's how i look at it anyway sure well so now nick can we do a little inside the actor studio questionnaire type thing let's do it okay i i have his his questions you remember james lipton put the i can never say the guy's name but mard p bravo or however you say his name I never say it. But, but yeah, Bernard Pivo. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so first off, what's your favorite word? It's a man. It's a it's a curse. It's dip something. That's my favorite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that that might dipstick. <laughs> dipstick. Yeah. That's the one. All right. What's your least favorite word? Um, I mean the the classics. I I I don't really like the word crunchy. Crunchy. I, I don't know. There's this. Yeah, there's something about it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't mind things that are crunchy. I just don't like it when I hear the word. The word crunchy. <laughs> oh, I should stop saying it. No, it's okay. <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, this sounds so cheesy, but like kindness. Mm-hmm. When I see when I see somebody that I'm like, oh wow, especially being here and being in the in the acting world. When I see somebody that's like just genuinely kind i'm like oh man mm. that's nice <laughs> that is refreshing refreshing yeah i was just gonna say opposite what turns you off people that think they have something over you in 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 any kind of way mm. right people that think they are smarter than you or just yeah any anybody that thinks they're above you for for any reason like that i got i don't have any time for that Mm -hmm. move move on yeah what's your favorite curse word (laughs) yeah i mean i mean i I, i'm still a fan because the other one i don't even really consider a curse word i'm still a fan of the big one of the big uh that one f yeah that one (laughs) i got that just it works on so many levels um, what sound or noise do you love? Nothing crunchy. I love the sound. Uh, nothing crunchy. I <laughs> love the white noise sound of an airplane cabin. Oh. Mm. I, I really, I'm, I'm the type that needs to sleep with some noise. And that gentle hum of an airplane cabin, that's what heaven will be for me. Wow. See, I'm the complete opposite. But we'll, hey, to each their own, right? Mm-hmm. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, this is without question. Big diesel trucks that like rev the engine. Mm-hmm. You know, you hear, you hear that like stressed, like kind of sound that they make. Oh, it just, oh, I can't handle it. It just, it sounds like death, right? It sounds like pollution and struggle. And it just, ugh, I hate it. <laughs> That probably, does that happen a lot in New York? It does indeed. It does it? Okay. <laughs> I was even driving a truck like that for a while. Oh, so, what, like uh, your personal vehicle? No, no, no. Doing, oh. doing deliveries for gotcha. a company I was working for. Gotcha. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, I've been, uh, kind of my survival job in the city is working for a hospitality company. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't mind it as much. I really think... Um, I could do that. I think I could help somebody build a party and put the party on because, you know, parties, whatever. Not everybody can do them. They're not that important, but it's, there's a bunch of people in a room having fun together. Yeah. Not now, COVID, but. (laughs) Not not now. (laughs) Eventually. In the old world. Maybe in the new world. We'll see. There you go. 2021. (laughs) Yeah. Um, What profession would you not like to, to do? I've often thought that the worst job in the world 
is the person that has to work at the lost baggage claim center at a at an airport mm-hmm. because there just can't be anybody coming through the door that's ever in a good mood, right? right. Like everybody that comes in is mad. Um, so I, I, I think that's probably the worst. Absolutely. Yeah. No, the person's coming in upset and you're not going to make their day better unless you find the bag. Yeah. And you lost it, right? It's your fault. Yeah. Sure. I lost it. I threw your pink uh, bag into the river. Sure. Absolutely. In an, in another city. Exactly. All right. Now we're going to do a rapid fire round where it's a, lightning, lightning round. Yeah. Is you're going to get two options. It's this or that. And you got to pick one. You ready? Okay. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Burger or pizza? Pizza. Dog or cat? Dog. Winter or summer? Winter. Toilet paper, over or under? Under. TV or book? TV. (laughs) Movie at home or the movie theater? Movie theater. Ocean or mountains? Mountains. City or country? Ugh, city. (laughs) (laughs) Mac or PC? Mac. Mac. Ninjas or pirates? Ooh. Pirates. And finally, Marvel or DC? Marvel. All right. You did very well. <laughs> Thank you. I, that, that wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. I really thought I was going to stress out over that. No, no. It's just your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate the toilet paper under because everyone thinks that it should be over and I agree with you. I've, I've I've seen countless arguments made for the over, and and I just it just it doesn't make any sense to me. Just put it under where it's not bothering anybody. It's just against the wall, right? And it's over there if you need it. Exactly. Like you're going to hit it if it's in the front. You're going to okay. We don't have to. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, all you have to say to them is, "Do you have a cat? If it's under, it's not going <laughs> to unravel it. If it's over, you will." There you go. Yeah. yeah, the cat. Well, certainly the cat people are probably hip to this for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, Nick, thank you so much. We have learned yes, so much. Thank you. Guys, thanks for having me. It was nice talking to you. I hope I uh, was informative and not boring. <laughs> oh, no, you're very informative. Absolutely. One, one last question. One last question. Yeah. Being an actor and uh, like when you sit down and you watch a movie or a TV show does it kind of lessen the magic? I mean, can you see the seams, you know, having been on set? I mean, does it kind of like lose a little bit of its luster or magic? <laughs> it does. Aww. It does a little. And I try, that's how I know when I'm enjoying something, when I put that stuff aside. You know, if Joanna's watching something terrible and I'll come in and I'll just be the the worst Statler and Waldorf in the room possible. <laughs> and she's like, that's enough of that. Um, but if I'm really into something, no, I still enjoy it like I'm a kid. I will tell you this really quickly. When one of my favorite things to do when I'm being a jerk is when we see a commercial and somebody is doing something insanely embarrassing, like talking about flatulence or diarrhea or you know something like that, <laughs> My, my favorite thing to do is go Yale School of Drama <laughs> <laughs> because it's such a reminder, right? It doesn't matter where you went. We're all going for the same roles and we all have to take that diarrhea role, oh, don't yeah. we? <laughs> I'm a jerk that way, but. No, no, you're <laughs> realistic in that way. All right. Yeah. So thank you so much, Nick. Yes. I enjoyed this so much. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And I hope uh, you and Joanna and baby birdie are staying safe um, with all this craziness um, that's going on. We are. We're wearing our masks. We're doing what we're supposed to. Good. Thank you guys for having me. Awesome. Oh, yeah. driver over the age of 25? Then I'm your Uber. Wait a second, you're not Mama Duke.